good afternoon from Berlin. I'm speaking here and thank you for joining us for the session. Um, as you mentioned, or I mentioned before, it's part of the Library of Futures EMEA Regional Council webinar series. And I'd like to um, welcome you here warmly and I hope we will have a nice um, one and a half hour meeting and productive results. Let me give you one um, advice or notion. This webinar, you can see it on the slide, is being recorded and that the, this recording will be published on OCLC's website. Um, that's very, very important for, for legal reasons, I think. Um, let me introduce a little bit um, some tips with WebEx. Um, I think most of you are familiar with that, but um, to be sure that you have a clear understanding of how we can communicate in this situation, I would like to address these issues here. Camera and microphone are automatically off, so you are are not possible to jump in by audio or video signal. You can open the chat function, and that is basically the most interesting point here, by clicking on chat in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. And by using this, you can comment or ask a question during the presentation. You can see in the chat currently the colleagues uh, give you similar information what I'm doing here. If you have a question, feel free to send it either to all panelists, you have to choose, or to anyone in the in the audience, if you'd like to share it with all of us, you can. Um, we will arrange it that all the questions go to the panelists, and we can collect all the questions so they are not lost. Uh, lost. Um, we will make sure that the speakers get these questions at the end of all the presentations, which means we will have a range of presentations, and we are happy to get your input during the presentations or afterwards, and we will have the possibility to discuss these questions after the presentations. If you have some technical difficulties, send a message to the host. We can help you as we can from the offsite, but um, we can check maybe with you whether or why the technical uh, constraints are coming. We try to help you. But most of all, I think the experience is that this works very well. Now, let me start with our uh, um, webinar. We have uh, done here these housekeeping activities. In case of any question, please use the chat again. I would like to officially welcome you now all. And it's great to see so many of you in attendance. We've had 480. 81 registrations um, and currently we have um, around about 250 participants. I think this number will increase during the webinar. Interesting point, we have registrations from 45 countries all around the world, which means and shows us we are really in a global perspective here. My name and I'm, my, me, I'm speaking is Reinhard Altmüller. I'm the Deputy General Director of the State Library in Berlin. And um, I'm also a delegate on the Executive Committee of the EMEA, so the, the Regional Council EMEA in the OCLC organization. And it's my pleasure today to moderate this plenary session about the next generation metadata topic. This session is a closing part of a larger series of webinars and round tables discussions that have been taking place since February in different regions of our EMEA world. Due to the interest and global scope of the topic, it seems logical that the, the include is at a part of the Library Futures OCLC, OCLC EMEA webinar series. So this is, one can say, an end, but it's not an end, and we have to discuss it further. Let me give you some information on what OCLC and especially EMEA is doing. Um, we have um, the absolute interesting collage here. It represents so far what is OCLC doing. And why most of you are joining the call today, we are wide, a wide and diverse membership of libraries with common challenges and common um, facilities and we try to look out to the future. We hope that we can meet 
and soon meet again in person to exchange these ideas and have conversations. But we learned that the online dialogue is still a good opportunity to hear from you and fully from us, from OCLC, different perspectives, sharpen our knowledge and plan for the future of our libraries. I'm glad we can do this today and that so many of you are joining us is really brilliant. To give you an idea uh, what is behind the EMEAC Executive Committee, I'd like to show you this slide. And um, here can you see my fellow EMEAC Executive Committee members, colleagues here. We work together with OCLC to raise challenges and issues libraries are facing and gather insights to help advance librarianship just like today. And in this way, we are deeply in involved in the future discussions OCLC is doing. So the EMEA region counts more than 5,000 member libraries in 60 countries. So we do our best to represent these broad, this diverse interest of the library community. As you can hear, our different um, nice images and one of them are mine, so you understand why I'm here today. To give you a bit little more background, I'd like to get the next slide, please. Um, I would like to present a little bit the EMEA Regional Council Executive Committee, which follows an action plan every year on engaging topics for libraries. We communicate about the activities of the cooperative regionally and with colleagues. We are part of a network and we assist with the planning organization of the EMEA conference, yearly, the annual conference. I think you know this. Our action plans usually follow the thematic. Previously, we have been focusing on open access as well as discovery and fulfillment. And this year, the focus is on the sustainable develop development goals of the UNO. We work together with a membership and OCLC research, part of this kind colleagues are in here in the meeting today to gather insights and advance the future of library and librarianship. Let me present the speakers today and um, our overall topic is the, and you can see it with uh, airing the different partners and um, in and in, 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 in um, registered people here in our webinar is the importance of metadata. And I've seen lots of interest recently in this. Today, we are going to hear from the following speakers. who will round up the findings of the next generation metadata series and OCLC's reactions to these findings. So we have these different round of meetings. We have had these meetings and now OCLC, especially from the research group of OCLC will answer to the findings in the different roundtables. And I'd like to present at first the Executive Director for Technical Research, Andrew Pace, who is responsible for building a coordinated strategy between research and product. So this interesting interface between the development side and the productive side or production side. Further welcome Rachel Frick, Executive Director of the Research Library Partnership who directs OCLC's work and engagement with the RLP, the Research Library Partnership. First speaker is John Chapman. He is Senior Product Manager, Metadata Services, and oversees cataloging applications and helping to direct OCLC's linked data strategy. Fourth speaker is Tizia van der Waerf. He is a Senior Program Officer located in the OCLC research group, coordinating and extending the research of OCLC's work throughout Europe. So welcome her. And finally, from Germany, Annette Dortmund, senior product manager, who also works closely with OCLC's research group. So you can see we have both sides in. And so far as I remember, right, Tizia will start. And to make it easier, 
I won't interrupt the talks. So we will find we will have now five presentations from the colleagues, and we will have afterwards the common debate, common discussion. But feel free to jump into the chat and make notions, make comments, make que give questions, and give your remarks on that to, in order to have a vibrant and interesting um, webinar series. So we jump in into the findings from the roundtable discussions. I think, Tithia, I hand over the mic to you, and you will give us an idea how many of these rounds and, yeah, what about the results we have had in the past three months, I think, roundabout. Uh, four months, I think. Thank you so much, uh, Reinhard. Um, and indeed, welcome everyone to this closing uh, plenary of the OCLC research series on next generation metadata. So, as those of you who uh, have participated in the series will know, the round table discussions that we conducted in the first two weeks of March this year were centered around this. OCLC research report that was published last year. In this report, Karen Smith Yoshimura reported back from six years of intensive discussions on the evolution of the next generation of metadata with metadata managers from the OCLC Research Library Partnership. This report served as inspiration and background reading for our series of virtual roundtable discussions in different European languages. And I am particularly delighted to share with you the announcement by the National Library of Spain that they just published the Spanish translation of Karen's report on their website. So this will further help extend the reach and influence of her report in the international community. And I'm sure that Karen is very proud of this. Achievement. So with our roundtable discussions, we wanted to continue the conversation on the evolution of metadata and grow a shared perspective of the future metadata landscape. We held an opening plenary webinar on the 23rd of February. Then we conducted eight roundtable discussions in six different European languages in English, French, Spanish, German, Italian, and Dutch. And today we are closing the series with a plenary session where we are presenting the findings from the roundtable discussions. To get the discussions going, we kicked off each session with a mapping exercise, asking attendees to place next generation metadata projects that they were aware of on a two by two matrix characterizing three different application areas. One, bibliographic data and the supply chain, that's in the upper left quadrant. Two, cultural heritage data in the lower left quadrant. And three, research information management data and scholarly communications in the upper right quadrant. The lower right quadrant was reserved for anything else, the category other. Obviously, we started off with an empty map, and I will show you later a collage of all the eight maps that came out of the session. After the mapping exercise and talking a little bit about the different projects, we guided the discussion around this main question. How do we make the transition to the next generation of metadata happen at the right scale and in a sustainable manner, building an interconnected ecosystem, not a garden of silos? This question struck a chord with most of the participants, and that made the conversation very interesting. There was broad interest in participation. In total, we had 86 attendees from 71 different institutions, of which 48 from university libraries. They came from 17 countries, mostly from Europe, 
but also a few from the Middle East and North Africa. Hosting these roundtables in different languages was conducive to having deep conversations and meaningful interactions, and that was very much appreciated. We reported back the insights gained from each of these discussions in eight blog posts, which have all been published on OCLC's research blog, hangingtogether.org. We also translated the posts in the language in which the session was held. If you haven't read the posts yet, I certainly encourage you to do so. They are a five minute read each, and you'll get a very good idea of what was discussed there. The attendees found the roundtable discussions very inspiring. They appreciated the diversity of participants' backgrounds. They liked comparing experiences, the rich reflections, the free format. They liked the mapping exercise as a focal point. Many found the sessions too short. They were sessions of one and a half hour. And in fact, the Italian session was extended with another half hour because the conversation was so lively. Some asked for follow up meetings and some thought it would be good to have more decision makers at the table and other stakeholders. So all in all, we received very positive feedback. Annette and I will now present a synthesis of the roundtable discussions in three parts. In part one, I will present the most noteworthy, recurring and predominant threads in the conversations or topics. In part two, Annette will talk to one thread running through all the conversations, which was the transition from old to the new, or rather the question of how to build the new while still having to maintain the old and the established. And in part three, Annette will report back on the expectations and questions about OCLC's shared entity management infrastructure. At the end of each part, we will ask one of our panelists to respond to the findings. So now over to the first part the predominant topics of the discussions. The predominant topics can be extracted from this collage of the eight maps that came out of the round tables. The maps are interesting in several ways. I should warn that they are not representative for a region or a country as a whole, but they represent very well the focus and expertise of the attendees. Taken together, the maps show an interesting range of activities and projects that take place on very different scales, institutional, national, European, and international, and they provide ample opportunity for a conversation about linking up these initiatives across all these scales. Cultural heritage data projects and bibliographic data projects were predominant, as you can see, it's all on the left upper quadrant and lower left quadrant. They are most populated with the post-its, the yellow post-its and the different colors. And there were much less research information management pro uh, projects on the map, which was on the right upper hand of the map. And this was reflected in the discussions as well. Also in each session, the map showed interesting clusters of post-it notes relating to persistent identifiers like the ISNI, ORCID, VIAF, DOI, etc. And it demonstrated the importance that is attributed to persistent identifiers in the discussions. So at a high level, these were the three predominant topics and I will elaborate on each briefly now. Investing in authorities and identifiers. Libraries strongly focus on their authority files and on identifiers. They are investing in the transformation and publication of their authority files, both the name authorities and subject headings, 
to leverage them as next generation metadata. We heard that open government data policies are driving this focus. These policies foster the production, publication and reuse of public funded data and library data falls under this category together with weather data and cadaster data to name just a few. We also heard that these policies are driving collaboration at the national level. This collaboration is geared towards maximizing the benefits of centralization, normalization and efficiency of data production and publication. So, for example, in France, the two largest producers of library data, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France and ABES, have decided to collaborate and bring their data together and co-produce bibliographic data. The national entity file will be the national knowledge base containing all entities created by collection holding institutions in France, including authors, but also works, concepts, events and places. In the Netherlands, for example, a national agency for the country's digital heritage strategy is developing guidelines and gives training to help the cultural heritage sector publish its data as linked open data and in ways that it is interoperable and allows reuse. We also heard a wish for more national collaboration in more decentralized countries such as Spain, Belgium, Italy and Germany. During the conversations, we also heard a raised awareness of the need to achieve a critical mass of interoperable library data so that more libraries can hop on the train and benefit from the ride leading to the next generation metadata. This would allow them to transition and achieve efficiencies and bridge local metadata silos. As one participant from the first English session said, we have metadata from all of the collections and all the research outputs from the university. And that's a lot of day to day work. And we want to look at how to move those more into the next generation metadata processes instead. So in an effort to achieve critical mass, Libraries are intentionally feeding external systems with their data. Examples of external systems mentioned are the university's research portal, the ORCID database, Wikidata, etc. Libraries are also embedding persistent identifiers in the chain, in the value chain. In particular, the libraries and the bibliographic agencies that are also registration agencies for identifiers, such as ISNI, for example, and who operate in the context of their national bibliography and legal deposit tasks. Some of them, like the British Library, for example, proactively encourage the adoption of ISNI's upstream in publishers' metadata records and downstream through reconciliation with BIAF and Library of Congress NACO files so that the ISNIs are in the library's cataloging workflows. At several sessions, we heard concerns about the large number of cultural heritage projects that create separate and dedicated ontologies and vocabularies which then remain isolated and are of limited value to others. There were many observations about a lack of common standards and lack of interoperability across domains. We heard concerns about duplication of effort, and it seemed to all boil down to a lack of trust in external data. As this participant at the Dutch session said, when you refer to data that has already been defined by others, you relinquish control over that piece of information, and that can be a mental barrier against doing linked data the proper way. 
it is much safer to store and manage your da all the data in your own silo. But the moment you can let go of that, the world can become much richer than you could ever achieve on your own. The question is where to let go of control and where to focus and control. There's a growing sense of the need to negotiate with the different stakeholders and parties in the newly emerging ecosystem to agree on who does what. And the control issue is also an organizational and governance issue. It's perhaps not surprising that national libraries and international bodies are trying to position themselves in this new landscape and to see that many libraries are waiting to follow the lead. Around the topic of interlinking data, many other issues and opportunities were raised. The practice of aggregators was questioned. We heard that harvesting data, cleaning, normalizing, reconciliating and transforming at scale is still important in the transition period. But libraries want the enriched data or at least the identifiers to flow back to them so they can participate in the connecting game. Also, they believe that decentralizing the cleaning and reconciliation effort would make more sense and leverage local expertise. By decentralizing the workflows, the value proposition of linked data could be realized. In other words, by making linked data available from the source via APIs, the data could then be connected with other sources via multiple discovery hubs serving specific communities. We heard a lot of uncertainty about practices around data models, ontologies and vocabularies and how to connect them. In how far should libraries collaborate more and adopt shared semantic models? And then we heard also a lot of enthusiasm about the many opportunities of linked data like the opportunity to connect different languages, to link to more granular information than authority files provide, and the promise of automated subject indexing and name entity disambiguation with the help of artificial intelligence technologies. Finally, and this is the last topic that I'd like to mention, we, talk, we talked a lot about scale. And it became very clear that there is no such thing as one right scale for doing linked data. There are many different scales and the challenge then is making choices about what makes most sense for your institution. Efficiency is a driver, but it's not the only one. National policies are also drivers as we have seen. And so as a community, Libraries will need to manage all these multiple scales, and that too is quite a challenge. And on this note, I would like to invite Andrew Pace to give an OCLC perspective on uh, the topics which came up in these roundtable discussions. So Andrew, based on the experience um, that OCLC has gained in this area of next generation metadata, what is your response and reaction to these findings? Thank you, Titia, and, and thank you, Reinhardt. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm, I'm not going to make you look at me during my entire talk, so I might turn off my camera a little bit and uh, just uh, move on to our next slide. I'm looking. Um, uh, as you've likely already heard, uh, OCLC has been in this game for quite a long time. Uh, over a decade, and over that time, we have learned a great deal about what's needed to do linked data at scale. I'm not going to review this entire history project by project here, but instead focus on the last couple of major linked data research projects. Project Passage, uh, which was a linked data workflow and interface experiment using Wikibase and transforming metadata into linked data to improve digital collection discoverability, which was a content DM pilot project and compare them to what we've heard in this series. If, if you want more details on the decades worth of projects, or even if you want some getting started primers on linked data, you can use the link that appears at the top of this slide. But the point here is to review what we heard, learned, and discovered in these projects in the context of both the metadata series that has been undertaken 
and a Project SEMI, a culminating effort to see a decade's worth of research and development lead to a robust, scalable, and sustainable production service. It would take many slides to do these projects justice. Uh, so instead, if you haven't already, I would urge you to take a close look at the accompanying reports written by both OCLC staff and several of the library participants and published by OCLC Research. Uh, the links are on this slide, and I think someone was, had put them in the chat as well. But here's a quick summary of our findings. We learned that the Wikibase linked data infrastructure can be used to create structured data with a precision that exceeds current library standards. The platform enabled user-driven ontology design, but raised concerns about how to manage and maintain those ontologies. Supplemented with OCLC's enhancements and standalone utilities, the platform enabled librarians to see the results of their efforts in a discovery interface without leaving the metadata creation workflow. Uh, we also learned that more robust tools are required for local metadata management. To populate knowledge graphs with library metadata, tools that facilitate the import and enhancement of data created elsewhere are recommended. And the pilot also underscored the need for interoperability between data sources, both for ingest and export. And finally, traditional distinction between authority and bibliographic data can disappear in linked data description. Turning to the pilot on digital collection discoverability and with a little more detail, because I think it underlies the findings uh, and challenges in the series uh, that, was, that was conducted in the last several weeks. First, testing the value proposition. Cultural material discovery and data management can be significantly improved when the materials are described using a shared and extensible data model. Persistent identifiers greatly improve the precision and recall performance metrics for discovery. Additional information from external data sources can automatically and efficiently enrich the entity description. Turning to the shared data model, starting with existing Dublin Core and schema.org models provided a very solid set of initial classes and properties and the model could be effectively and responsively expanded based on new entities and relationships represented in the source metadata. When selecting and transforming metadata, these tools should be shared and the workflows decentralized in order to make the conversion scalable. Domain expertise is needed to determine how locally defined fields are used at the institution level and sometimes even at the collection level. And as we continue this linked data journey, substantial resource commitments will be required to carry out these data transformations. But the community does not need to wait for the transformation to linked data to be fully completed before they can see some benefits. A paradigm shift of the scale will necessarily take time to carry out and calls for long-term strategies and planning. And since my colleagues have already expressed the importance of library feedback through these series, the value of library participants as partners in these projects cannot be overstated. Recognizing the critical insights contributed by the project partners confirms the importance of involving library staff in this manner for similar technical research projects. But it is also indicative of the kinds of models we will need to give lift and long-term sustainability to this work. For example, VIOF, the Virtual International Authority File, is a technical infrastructure for national bibliography and authorities, but it is also an agreement between libraries as members of the VIOF Council. FAST is a faceted vocabulary, more lightweight than the Library of Congress subject headings, but it is also given strength by the FAST Policy and Outreach Committee, made up of member libraries. Our linked data endeavors will require similar confederations, advisory groups, and shared effort. This is the kind of stronger together mentality that built WorldCat and it is the kind of collaboration that will carry us into the future. Next slide, please. What we heard in this series was a fantastic affirmation of the things we heard during both the Passage and Content DM Digital Collections pilots and prototype work. As the projects ended, we did some extensive interviews with participants in addition to the information found in the report, but we, what we heard dovetails wonderfully with what we heard from all of you about what it would take to support entity infrastructure in the future as a data provider. You told us that publishing data on the web will drive national collaboration, and we knew from experience that this will require persistent identifiers relevant to library workflows. 
In particular, identifying creative works and persons are particularly relevant. The effort requires integration of services and capabilities so that the new identifiers can be minted during the descriptive process. We learned to great delight that libraries are already investing in authorities and identities, and that this goes beyond simply converting legacy data from record-based descriptions. In order to achieve new linking, there's a need for reconciliation and linking across a number of different vocabularies and ontologies, including from outside the library community. And finally, we heard that libraries will need to manage multiple scales of work, as Titia mentioned. Scale is difficult to achieve at a local institution level. National, regional, and consortial infrastructures are convenient and attractive for smaller institutions. Libraries need efficiency of scale to mint, manage, and maintain identifiers. Libraries need efficiency of scale from aggregators to clean, normalize, reconcile, and transform legacy metadata records. But we also heard that data should be transformed, created, and created authoritatively where the expertise lies. National scale makes sense to coordinate or centralize efforts because of cultural and language differences and because of the different bibliographic principles and missions that need to be upheld. We also need to consider disciplinary scale and the differences between humanities, social sciences, and hard sciences data. Putting all of these pieces together, I picture a sort of continuum of needs and activities. The research projects, their feedback, and your, feed and your feedback can be seen not in juxtaposition, but as a linked continuum of effort. A lot of metadata description hinges on linking the short tail and the long tail together in order to improve the whole. So in this new environment, we balance a large, shared, homogeneous collections and data while accounting for a myriad of decentralized and heterogeneous collections. We improve machine learning and scaled reconciliation with the necessary tools for the dedicated knowledge work that also happens in libraries. We can start in the big spaces involving person names and bibliographic works while acknowledging and preparing for the more difficult work ahead, like concepts, aboutness, and notes. And we can prepare for the pending paradigm shift that comes with blending bibliographic and authority work together and the challenges of balancing object description with an increase in contextual description. And across this continuum, we know that a large decentralized, I'm sorry, that a large centralized infrastructure is needed and that custom applications will enhance the effort. All of this will facilitate a new kind of knowledge work in metadata management, discovery, and access in libraries. How will we bridge the effort between the short tail and the long tail, between the scaled effort and localized domain and collection expertise? I would argue that we're already doing a lot of this right now, right here, but we know that the systems and services required are not ready. We know that there will be ongoing professional development and training needs. So on that topic, I'll turn things over to my colleagues, Aneta and Rachel, to discuss the challenges and opportunities ahead. Thank you, Andrew. And I'll follow Andrew's example by um, keeping the video on just for a short time and then turning it off again. Right, so looking at the challenges and opportunities during this time of transition, as Andrew mentioned, systems aren't ready. And indeed, this is what you told us very clearly in all the sessions. You are trying to build new while maintaining the old, but the systems used in libraries do not support this transition. Current systems such as legacy library management systems or even the current library service platforms, but also repository software, regardless of provider, do not usually support the seamless integration of persistent identifiers, of local authorities, of links to external sources such as Wikidata. As a result of this, workflows are not integrated. Libraries need to make use of additional systems, such as Wikidata or even Wikibase, to get the next gen metadata work done, which in the end is a duplication of effort and a waste of time. In part because systems used in libraries are not ready, next-gen metadata work is often treated not as part of the general work, but as projects. 
And these projects are often based on one-off funding, which makes it difficult to maintain achievements when the project has run out or to transform projects into production services. Projects born only because government funding happened to be available are destined to die. The projects that survive the project phase and leave the project status to become sustainable services are often those where there's deep understanding concerning the relevance of next-gen metadata and the urgency to get it implemented. These are likely to have a clear purpose. These are likely to have high quality targets for the data, including stability and reliability of sources of data. And there is likely a differentiated view on which types of users the data is intended to serve and how. Because they actually deliver value by, for example, improving existing services, these types of services have a much greater chance of sustained and lasting impact. So as one participant from the German session noted, let us get rid of the project concept, but rather acknowledge that this is an ongoing effort which needs appropriate staffing, unlimited job positions and sufficient financial resources. In this realm, at least of next generation metadata, we should no longer be working on a project basis. Getting beyond the project status and appropriate staffing, as mentioned in the participant quote, leads us directly to the next challenge. Next gen metadata work is often a stretch assignment on top of everything else. And because systems aren't ready, it needs to happen in systems, in systems that staff is not yet used to. So training, even where members of staff do have the time to invest in upskilling is not always available. That's what you told us. In other words, what is needed here is to somehow flatten the learning curve for library staff to accelerate the upskilling of staff. So they spend less time on learning and more time on actually working with next gen metadata. And as you told us, this is feedback we received from you after one of the sessions. It would be necessary to focus a lot on training and try to create an alliance between several stakeholders. OCLC's role could be to promote and coordinate knowledge. OCLC can really play a role of icebreaker. It can also foster international knowledge on the most current issues. So let us hear from Rachel Frick now what the opportunities are in this area. Rachel, the floor is yours. Oops. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Ananta. I'll be turning off my camera right now. So yes, training, education, and just general engagement, re-engagement on this topic is really important. I think it's important to bring out this, what we call the Gartner hype cycle visual for this conversation, because I feel like we've been talking about linked data for quite a while. And for some folks, we've been talking about it so long they've lost interest. And then this is really crucial as we're really as we're progressing towards the time to see that area of productivity and realize of seeing linked data come into operational practice to reinvigorate and re-engage around this area of education, training, and strategic planning about how libraries transition to this next generation of metadata. It's important to provide those training and um, education opportunities for our practitioners, for our managers, so they can understand the opportunities and effectively communicate the need for training and connect professionals to the training, as well as engaging leaders to recognize the priority to address um, professional development, um, skill investment, and honestly, time to work on prototyping activities that Andrew had talked about earlier. I'm happy to say that OCLC has been thinking a Along, along, along these lines and these three different levels of education and understanding around linked data. It's really important as we're developing projects like SEMI that John Chapman is going to be talking about later, and as well as when we're working through these prototype activities at OCLC, 
that we develop a community that understands and recognizes the value of next generation metadata and the need for professional development. It is unwise to develop a tool that no way understands or recognizes the value or doesn't have the knowledge to operate to move us forward. Along those efforts, OCLC has multiple layers of engagement with metadata, next generation metadata, and specifically around linked data. Along the lines of practitioner resources, we have our open educational resource called Web Junction that has a wide course catalog specifically on basics around linked data and cataloging. We also have the OCLC Community Center that has a whole community around cataloging and metadata that engages on that practitioner level. Within my own program, the Research Library Partnership, we have a robust and active engagement group targeted on metadata managers, those folks that are growing our skilled practitioners in this area, as well as those tasked to communicating to leadership what is needed to transition us to this new exciting area of metadata growth. We are also looking about what is needed to engage and recapture the excitement and imagination of library leaders around linked data, because Andrew said, this is going to require substantial resource investment, as well as long-term strategy and planning and identifying strategic partnerships to move us forward. This can only happen if this linked data future, this next generation future is recognized by our library leaders in order to do that required strategic development, stakeholder um, cultivation, and attracting resources to support this transition. It's also required to engage our leaders so that they can invest time and resources on continued development through prototyping and um, contribution in these community conversations. OCLC will be working um, diligently in the next few months to report, um, report out on these strategic necessities in reports and resources aimed at the leadership level. So we will be continuing our education efforts in this spot to meet the needs that were expressed by the breakout groups and targeted at these particular areas. Thank you so much, Rachel, for your perspective on uh, the skills and professional development area. And so the last uh, part of this uh, session um, is really about you know the expectations and the questions that were raised um, during our uh, roundtable discussions around um, OCLC's shared entity management infrastructure. So in nearly all of the sessions, we uh, talked a little bit about it. There was not an it was not an extensive topic because it was not that was not you know the subject. The subject was much broader. But of course, all the attendees were very keen to better understand what OCLC's platform is going to look like. Um, and they also um, were very intentional in, and explicit in uh, telling us, you know, what the expectations are. So it is the platform is expected to help connect and integrate their collections internally and externally and there's one uh one person during the first english session who was very uh, enthusiastic and who said this project uh, referring to oclc's platform this project is really going to transform the way we work it will mean that we are able to connect our metadata with our partner institutions it will mean that medieval manuscripts will no longer be in this walled garden. And that was exactly the topic of uh, our sessions. So there were a lot of uh, hopes around that it would bring a solution for multilinguality, that it would be uh, a platform that could be used to build national infrastructures. Um, and there were all kinds of questions around functionality, data ownership, governance, the business model, etc., etc. And I think 
that was this, I can uh, ask John uh, to please uh, give us a little more insight in uh, in OCLC's uh, platform, and maybe you can answer some of these questions. That would be great. Yes, yes. Um, thank you very much. And um, that's me. I'm waving, and now I'm going to turn off my video. And um, yes, so thank you for the introduction. Um, as as we heard um, at the beginning from Richard, I'm in charge of our cataloging applications, uh, but also in terms of our uh, linked data strategy, helping drive that. And um, after involvement in some of the projects that Andrew mentioned, um, we really saw the need um, for a project that developed an infrastructure. Uh, so not just the end user applications, but a, a broader infrastructure to support that work. So I'm going to be talking about the project, but keying off of the questions um, that came up uh, during the sessions. Um, just some basics, though, um, addressing some of those questions about what is it, um, what's the data, and what's the business model. The entity data will be published on the web as linked open data. This is consistent with how we publish uh, WorldCat data. So WorldCat data is published as CC BY. Um, and we will, um, you know, if you think of the model of VOF where um, every VOF ID has a resolvable URI, uh, that's what we're looking at there. So there'll be a web presence um, at which every URI that we're publishing for entities will have a page that will give uh, linked open data for that entity. Um, we, I heard earlier from uh, from Aneta the questions about from projects into into programs and and projects into products. When we got the grant for the project, which came from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, uh, they were very interested in having us uh, speak to sustainability, uh, speak to how after the two year grant. Um, that wraps up this December, how the infrastructure would be sustained over time and what our model was for revenue uh, in order to fund that. So what we're doing is uh, providing subscription access for those who want to edit um, the entity data and also to use APIs. And I wanna be clear on the APIs that we're providing both a, a read API uh, for entity discovery but also providing API access for, uh, for, for management, that is for editing, um, adding, and um, creating entities. Um, and so what that will look like then is that we'll have um, opportunities for um, a variety of entries into editing the entity data, into using it. And we know that some libraries are primarily interested in consuming this data, uh, that is to uh, improve discovery outcomes for their users, and others are interested in doing that, but also in participating in the ongoing management and curation of that data. Uh, we really see this as an evolution in, in a natural evolution of what we've done for the last 50 years in terms of enabling a shared metadata uh, editing environment. Um, up to now, it's been focused on on Mark and its various flavors, <clears throat> but uh, we see the the provision of this infrastructure as being a way to provide a shared editing system focused on native link data. Um, so we are hoping that there will be broad participation from all sorts of libraries. Of course, we'll also have uh, some functions within the system that OCLC staff will be responsible for. Um, and so that speaks to the, to, um, to the governance question. We really hope to have a community effort and a minimum, uh, a light touch from OCLC staff in terms of stepping in to do, you know, merges, deletions, that sort of thing as needed. Um, there was a question that came in over chat that I wanted to address. Um, Ricardo asks, uh, will VOF thus be a kind of subset or building block for semi? So um, it is a separate project. It, it does uh, make use of VOF cluster data, um, but really we are hoping to uh, broaden the pool 
um, of entities that it that it addresses. And so, uh, because of its um, because of its sources, uh, VOF is um, somewhat um, tilted towards those types of persons, for example, who are engaged in the creation of of published materials. Um, and we're hoping with uh, this infrastructure to expand into the world of um, uh, special collections, digitized materials, uh, local materials. Um, and we saw a lot of promise, as Andrew mentioned, in both the uh, content DM link data pilot and also in uh, Project Passage, that there's a particular appeal and strength to uh, surfacing some of those um, maybe locally important names or creative works and connecting those to the broader uh, broader network. So the goals of the project are really to address infrastructure needs. Um, so we've, you know, ever since uh, Project Passage, we've heard a lot about um, needs of libraries around infrastructure. Um, they want they want infrastructure providers to have persistent URIs um, to stand behind those um, for many, many years. Um, they also need to have native um, linked data management tools. So really not you know, looking beyond the model of conversion and really um, utilizing the capabilities of the new data model, um, which is not primarily record-based. And they also see a need for infrastructure providers to do um, a lot of the linking between library data and non-library data, but also between um, local vocabularies and um, linked data uh, aggregations, and also with this more centralized aggregation. So we heard a lot of that um, in the comments earlier there's this question of the right scale. We, we believe that the right scale for OCLC is to operate at this level, um, knowing that the, the challenge is large enough that we need to bring to bear technical solutions and some automated solutions to get us part of the way there. And then to have this shared metadata management system for expertise and um, sub and subject matter experts to really uh, bring it the rest of the way. Our goals obviously then are also to operate sustainably, to do so at a large scale, um, and also to complement other efforts that are in the environment as we um, heard very well earlier from, from Aneta. Um, and, then the and then the goal here is to deliver products and services and linked data in mass uh, December, 2021. So some other questions that came up that, that were identified were around um, multilingual approaches um, and around integration with other services and applications. I also wanted to uh, talk about how we're thinking about quality. So uh, first with multilingual approaches, of course, this issue has multiple dimensions. And so there's the dimension of interface and OCLC is committed to providing its interfaces in multiple languages. Um, but then there's also the issue around the, the metadata itself or, or the linked data itself. And so that is um, the multilingual approaches that we're pursuing right now are based on machine learning and making sure that we can do um, entity extraction out of metadata in a variety of languages. And so that's going through a lot of the data assets that we have uh, at OCLC and making sure that we can get in there and recognize uh, entities that are described in other languages. The third dimension of um, multilingual approaches is really having um, labels and um, text um, strings within um, these metadata descriptions in order to facilitate searching, facilitate access. And that's something that we really do look to a combination of some machine approaches in terms of leveraging data that's out there, but also making sure that our applications are smart about enabling um, this type of description in multiple languages. 
I wanted to talk about um, the quality emphasis too. Uh, we really do want to make sure that we emphasize um, data quality, but also have um, a transparent um, set of metrics so that we can communicate to our users about um, whether rather than the data being of high or low quality, the data might be incomplete or the data needs more input. Um, and so that's something that we are really leveraging to, you know, core technologies around um, knowledge graphs in order to say, we expect entities to have a certain shape, a certain set of connections to other entities. If those aren't there, how can we surface that to our end users and make sure that they can contribute and draw some of those connections? Um, Tizia mentioned having libraries participate in the connecting game. So we saw in both the content DM link data pilot and in project passage, the connecting game is actually really fun. And so we wanna make sure that we have an interface that enables that work and makes that rewarding to draw those connections between things. Um, there, there was another question too about the integration with other services and applications. Of course, we're looking to integrate this data uh, within other OCLC applications. And so I think you can think about it as uh, primarily in two, two types. So in one type, you have leveraging this data um, to improve or augment uh, discovery. Uh, so the tools that OCLC offers that are specifically for discovery, but also in a discovery or augmentation role within metadata creation interfaces. So having knowledge cards, that sort of thing. The other type of integration that, that we'd wanna see is the ability to really jump in and create entities as needed um, from a variety of different applications. So those are sort of the two, the discovery side and the metadata creation side um, that we're looking to um, provide services uh, against both of those. Um, there's a question that came in from uh, Enel. Um, will the entity management infrastructure support a Sparkle-like um, a Sparkle-like uh, endpoint or other linked data query interface? And if so, is this regarded as an API function that requires a subscription? Yes, we do. We do anticipate offering Sparkle access um, under subscription. Um, that is something that we plan to do. Um, the other questions from Andrew Dunning. Andrew has been a great participant in our um, linked data, in our entity management uh, advisory group. Um, he asks for an update on the development uh, status of semi costs. Um, all of that sort of thing. I'm not going to talk about costs and subscription models today. Some of that is still in development. Um, the development status of semi overall, though, is we're entering our uh, third checkpoint, which will be midsummer or uh, June or July, uh, from the American point of view, um, and that is um, going to be uh, offering testing to members of our entity management advisory group uh, to look at both the data and the interfaces that we're, uh, that we're providing. Um, and based on feedback from the last checkpoint, which was in uh, December, January, um, that's really led us to um, address the quality issue in particular and make sure these entities are, are rich enough uh, to support the type of discovery that people want to use. So Andrew, stay tuned, and of course, we will be communicating through the advisory group um, as we nail down more details on subscriptions and prices. So um, some of the questions that came in regarding SEMI um, were really future focused, and I think uh, larger questions, they echo trends within all of the discussions that happened uh, both in this series and previous. And that's really um, what is the efficient use of resources and what is the right way to um, divide and conquer <laughs> in terms of leveraging the strengths of uh, national agencies, of individual libraries, and of aggregators like OCLC. 
Um, and so that's something that we expect um, to be an ongoing conversation. We have excellent models for this in terms of the type of governance that uh, we've done with um, with ISNI and with VIOF. We expect to have ongoing uh, relationships and conversations with national agencies. Um, but we also want to make sure that we leverage um, subject matter expertise from a broad broad pool of uh, research institutions, academic institutions. Um, and so this feels like something that's going to be an ongoing conversation. Um, and there's not necessarily an easy answer to that. Um, a comment on the on the opening slide for this section mentioned uh, walled gardens um, and share, shared environments. So that's something that we're very cognizant of. Uh, we want to make sure that we have identifiers and uh, infrastructure that anybody can use, um, and that they are putting uh, putting forth effort to share with others. Uh, we also understand the need to express uh, concepts and topics and such things in national, regional, or language-based uh, cultures as well. So these feel like there's not an easy answer. I don't think you would expect one, but these are um, these are on our docket as we um, continue the discussions, not just about linked data, but about um, number of topics around inclusion around expression of, of of regional cultures and just making sure that as an infrastructure provider we are being a responsible party to those conversations as well um one uh i know i'm running out of time or have used up a lot of my time already um i do want to address one one question here uh from from jan um, so, so this is around, uh, it says the strategy is focused very much on data production, but what will happen with the gigantic silo of already existing bibliographic data? Is there a strategy to convert and to connect them as well? So a lot of the, um, a lot of the design of our project is around this idea of a mixed environment for some time. So we expect that. Just in the United States, for example, we expect there to be um, libraries that are enthusiastic about moving to new models, about BibFrame, about customized versions of BibFrame. There are libraries that mix that with uh, Dublin Core um, or, or RDF-based models. And then there's libraries that are going to be on Mark um, uh, or flavors of Mark for as long as they can. Um, what we see uh, of a primary benefit and promise of uh, linked data and entity-based models is around um, enabling new discovery tools and so we expect that um, we will have this mixed mixed model of conversion of data of native linked data and of data that just lives and breathes and in, in, in mark for some time um er, early indications seem to be that many libraries will want to maintain uh, mark based workflows for what i'd call inventory control for acquisition circulation that sort of thing um, but then leverage these new um these new uh, uh data models in order to improve their discovery so uh, we'll be negotiating that and and trying to make sure that we have um services of value to all libraries no matter where they are on that on that spectrum um, but also keeping an eye on not duplicating effort um, as much as possible i think there are good patterns to um, transform existing bibliographic data from our legacy systems into a linked open data environment um, so i think it's not only ocl cl well um, a lot of institutions are doing that but I think the question of Jan Jan is 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 really interesting um, because it addresses some so far um, another part of of the view we've got from the different round tables and from the panelists here. Um, we discussed a lot about the future of data management, data transformation, data net and uh, networks. Um, 
consistent with um, um, research projects, for example, and other domains we have to address maybe. And this could be one question, two questions. One question with regard to the GLAM sector, um, so galleries, archives, museums, beside of the um, libraries as part of the cultural her heritage um, infrastructure how they could be involved into these new increasing infrastructure elements. Um, maybe this is a question for the panelists um, or for the people from OCLC too. Um, and the other question maybe is the production part. We still have people who produce metadata and uh, maybe this is even a basic uh, question. What does it mean, the new world of entity-based um, data views and data management systems? Um, in, in the form of um, the production of metadata, entirely or automated driven, automatically driven? Um, I can, I would just say it's a huge question. Um, I would say that um, one likely model may be that we have the drive to continue to have locally customized um, workflows around what I mentioned earlier about inventory control. Um, you know, the different types of institutions have dramatically different needs there, whether you're a museum or a special collection or archive or a lending library. Um, but all of them can benefit from having um, things in their collection expressed in the in the vocabulary of these entities because that ties together um, representations of the same thing um, so that that's the way that i think about it but i'm sure the other panelists have um, deeper thoughts than that <laughs> this is this is andrew uh, so just an additional thought on that i think that the um, and, and actually, the previous question that John was answering too about the data production, I think, you know, if we focus on that sort of uh, what John mentioned about persistence and and consistency in the creation of URIs, um, and if you think about when I talked about the the uh, digital collections work, where uh, the authors are, are primarily unique, um, the 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 collections are unique. Um, so what increases is sort of that contextual metadata description, no longer being constrained by just describing the item in hand. So I think when I think about the GLAM institutions, I think about um, uh, libraries doing contextual description within the ecosystem of these other sort of either library adjacent or external to the library um, community. Um, so that we're no longer constrained by single vocabularies. We're, we're no longer constrained um, by just the the uh, the single record that's going into uh, the library system. So I think that's what we'll see more um, sort of contextual uh, relationships between the, the entities and library systems and non-library systems. Anyone else? Um, well, this set of questions and. Um, some other questions coming arising now. Um, one question is very practically, pragmatically, conver conversion tools to integrate legacy data into CMI. A question for John, I think. Oh, sure. Um, so we do anticipate having, as I mentioned, um, APIs for um, adding entities to the aggregation. Um, and then in the future, through our UI tools, we an anticipate offering um, sort of a, I'm not sure what the right uh, phrase here is, but sort of an augmented um, data enrichment tool. So somewhere between unattended um, data loading and, you know, by hand uh, cataloging, we believe that there's a opportunity for sort of small batch um, metadata enrichment as you're putting things into the aggregation. So this is a model that uh, worked well um, in a number of the projects on Andrew's uh, banner slide in terms of particularly around um, special collections, um, uh, archival materials, that sort of thing. This sort of uh, spreadsheet based model of, of uh, of uh, metadata management that a lot of institutions use, um, having that sort of um, 
refinement happening as the metadata comes in. Uh, so that's something that we anticipate offering. Um, there's also a question here that I'm seeing Richard around um, from from Eno around uh, schema.org. Um, yes, so we do. We we are currently and have for for many years paid special attention to schema as a as a great way to express um, linked data uh, from WorldCat. So we anticipate continuing that um, uh, that attention and um, treating that as a formal. Um, input into our uh, internal ontologies as well. No, thank you very much. I think that's a good answer to clarify this issue. Because uh, schema.org started with, with the uh, big, big um, um, ideas and um, seems to be shortened a little bit in the discussion. But I think it's a bit difficult, different or diff a, a heavy weight part of the infrastructure. It could be. Um, and and in this sense, we have something like a new understanding of OCLS's infrastructure, and I think I'm happy to to get this information. Do we have um, other questions in the uh, in in the in, in our uh, group of registered people? And I know I noticed a question to the subscription model for the foreseen new services coming from Rita Albrecht. Um, she feels a bit that a new hurdle and frontier that hinders the linking of library with non-library data could arise. Could you answer this in some way? Sure. So, so OCLC's goals are to um, continue providing um, linked data services for the long term. And I mentioned 50 years of um, a shared system for managing library metadata. Um, that is based on providing value to libraries um, that they have paid for via subscription. So we think it's a proven model um, and it's one that doesn't, um, I, I think it's the most honest uh, business model in which if libraries find value in what we provide, they pay for it. We're not a private company, um, you know, funded or getting big money from Google or, or, or Facebook or anything else. Um, and so we believe that by, by publishing the data as linked to open data online, but then paying for essentially the infrastructure through a subscription model is a proven model. And it's one that um, we think will work. In terms of linking library with non-library data, um, in addition to asking users to do that, um, OCLC has entered and continues to enter a number of partnerships in terms of working with uh, data vendors upstream, um, both inside and outside the library world, to make sure that we're um, connecting to and representing their metadata. So that's something that we also uh, will continue to do. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, continue our discussions with national libraries and other regional agencies to make sure that we're doing a good job of linking and referring to each other's data as well. tools, the two boxes you offer on the one hand, and the data on the other hand. Um, and so far as I got the question right, um, it was addressed to this, do we have open data or do we have um, subscription services for tooling or do we have the data integrated into the tools and the services around it? Sure. So, um, we, you know, actually initially on um, on our Mellon uh, grant proposal, we assumed that we would be uh, providing for fee services primarily around and based on the value of the APIs. Um, and that we almost thought of the interface work as being secondary or included in that. Uh, what we heard after talking with um, libraries um, in smaller groups and, and focus groups was that they saw the value and the um, the reason to really subscribe actually in that interface. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the appeal of the APIs was strong for some libraries and not for others. Um, and so that told us that, you know, for, for, for a subset of libraries, 
and many of them are ones that are used to using OCLC tools like Connection or Record Manager, that's where they see OCLC providing value over and above just publishing data is to make sure that we're providing tools that allow for this sort of linking. Um, and so that's where we think that we have a strong role to play, but our role is also in um, agreements and in um, infrastructure. So for example, in the United States, the Library of Congress publishes the Library of Congress name authority file. OCLC has partnered with uh, LC for a long time as a node uh, for editing of that file through the NACO program. And so that is a service provided on top of freely available data, but it's one that um, cataloging subscribers feel is valuable because we offer the combination of the partnership so that we're sending data back and forth continuously with LC, but we're also providing the tool set and um, you know affordances that are that are easy to use for maintaining that file. So. Um, you know, that's that's a view across both the data um, the mm -hmm. partnership and the end user facing application. And we think that's a good model for the future as well. Interesting new insights. I have um, I've, I've got having the block in, in, in mind. Um, one final question um, with regard to interoperability between the IFLA library reference model on the one hand and the CMI data model. Um, Will be the data model of CMI will be interoperable between or with both BibFrame and the library reference model of IFLA. Um, I know they are different levels of of uh, yeah. abstraction, abstraction, but uh, maybe you have an answer for us. Yeah, so we we have we have communicated in a few different um, presentations the relationship between the two, and I, I don't feel safe trying to do justice to that in the next forty seconds, uh, but it's that. Cool. Um, that dis that slide and that discussion is one that I will find a way to share um, with the broader broader group. Maybe you can um, give us a link into the chat um, as a part of the answer. Maybe in the in the coming yeah, two months or something that maybe this is helpful, and we can get this into the um, put this into the uh, documentation of our yeah really vibrant and interesting webinar and i would like to thank you very very much for questions and for co of course for the panelists for the answers uh, i said it's been an exciting ride the journey to next generation metadata um and it's gratifying to hear from all the professionals in the field how engaged they are with the topic outside of oclc in the community of oclc in, in the oclc professional groups um even the round table series have really been a very successful um, in providing a forum for holding such deep and meaningful conversations like we have had today. Um, yeah, which assertions will be proprietors over others? Uh, this is an ascending question we've got. We've got, we learned somehow um, about the ideas around Spark and parts. We've learned a lot about CMI further development, um, and we are really keen to get the results uh, end of the year. I, I noticed that this will be the final date, but we will get results in the run of the summer. Um, I, from my point of view, the discussion about uh, the involvement of GLAMS, GLAM, the GLAM sector on the one hand, the production part of metadata, the specific role for OCLC as a data handler and offerer of services for example, for alignment tools or same as services, what I'd like to add here. Um, the interesting insight discussion about the future um, business models around the new services. Um, I think we will get some more discussions like this one, round tables to, to get more of this. And um, for, of course, um, it's how it's not a worst result. Uh, it's not the worst result when questions provoke new questions. That's my impression. That's what makes the magic of further development. And I think we should come back to that. Um, I've have even heard that OCLC has been asked to continue the conversation in both Italy and Spain. And there are many others interested in engaging more closely with OCLC, both as a facility of expert meetings on this topic. So you can say OCLC as a host, but also as a technology part that pilot the next generation infrastructure. This is all very exciting, and I hope that we all get the power to 
I will come closer with that. You find in the chat, dear colleagues, um, 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 a small or very short survey, which will be very helpful if you could answer to that, because we can um, use the feedback from your from your side um, to yeah facilitate better webinars for the next time and to get more into involved into the debates discussions of your interest um, so help us to um, add your thoughts into next formats next um, um, events OCLC and the MIR region council will make I fear that our EMAC, EMIAC next conference will be online mostly too, so we can use that to learn from you. And so my pleasure is, oh, I would like to um, ask you to fill in this small survey on Survey Monkey. It takes you two minutes and not more, and we thank you very much for that. Overall, I would like to um, thank you all, and um, I have no image on the video wall I put my, my own on um, and I'd like to um, say goodbye for this afternoon and I hope for nice new um, events with you you can here see one of the next um, events will be tomorrow as this will be on the implementing of the sustainable development goals I mentioned it before in my library some tips fingertips to that to address libraries needs or better to say the needs of the society for libraries driven by different fields of interest from the sustainable local codes please use the opportunity and register at the address you find in the chat thank you very much thank you especially for the panelists and the two speakers Annette and Ticia and see you again soon <laughs>